He just says little black boys, little Negro boys don't be lawyers. They be carpenters and, and things like that. That crushed his spirit. I mean, here's a guy with an honor roll, the top of his class. Not any class, majority white students, but he's at the top. That changed the course of how he began to interact in this world. He goes off to Boston, hey, and lives with his sister, and he's introduced to the street life. He's introduced to the street culture, and he becomes a street of heart, addicted to that. See, when you are an oppressed human being, you find yourself worth in that dirt. That dirt may be selling drugs, that dirt may be pimping, that dirt may be what, whatever, and that's what happened. See, Malcolm never, he, he wasn't from Detroit. He was from Lansing. But he said, call me Detroit Red because nobody knew, about, knew, knew nothing about Lansing. But there's more Detroit Reds in my city that I come from than when they called him Detroit Red. Because the same social circumstances that created Detroit Red over 50 years ago still exist in my community. Exist in Milwaukee, exist in Harlem, New York. So you have to look at the greater circumstances of the legacy of this, of this man, but also looking at the people that he comes from. So Malcolm was bold enough to, to be the, the, a teacher, but he taught from his experience. See, many of us want to talk and teach, but we don't want to teach from our own experience. You know, we come from alcoholic mothers, we come from abandoned fathers, we come from broken communities that produce broken human beings. But once Malcolm fixed himself, the shame went away. The pain went away. A confident man came. But he just didn't grow out of, out of the sky. Malcolm, he, he changed his mind of the knowledge that he received. His little brother tricked him. He said, if you want to get out of prison, I don't know how, how to get out. I said, oh yeah, I want to get out of prison. What you mean, you, you got the secret? Stop eating pork. That ain't nothing, man. I'll stop eating pork. No, read this book. Message to the black man. He was introduced to Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That became a father figure in his life. Remember, his father was murdered. So again, it comes back to the family structure. Here's a man that's almost 20, 25, 26 years old, has a father in his life again. That, that sets a, sta a standard, that sets an example. That he begins to make atonement within himself. Because many of us who, who get, find ourselves in, in the system, they tell us that you're going to pay a debt to your society. Mm. You don't owe shit to the society. No, nope, at all. Yeah, yeah. And that's when he came home to work on the behalf of the liberation and the struggle of his community to make it better. You saw a man who was committed. So when he came home to Detroit and was, and was working with his brothers in, in the mosque in Detroit, man, we only got 20, 20 30 members. We, this, should be, this should be packed. This message is that powerful. And all the like Muhammad, man, we, we got something here. Here's a brother that believes. He began to organize mosques across the country. He was selfless like that. He was committed like that. So we talk about respect the ethics. We have to respect the principles that the man represented. Right. Right. See, you can quote Malcolm X, but you can't show up on time. That's a contradiction there. Yeah. You can quote Malcolm X, but you can't complete a damn task. That's a contradiction there. You can quote Malcolm X, but you're not a good father. That's a, that's a contradiction there. You can quote Malcolm X, but you beat your women. That's a contradiction there. That goes against everything that Malcolm stood for. See, Malcolm was a, a teacher that taught for liberation. He didn't teach for accolades. He didn't teach to be recognized by somebody besides his people, to recognize the importance of fighting against a system. See, we got all these master teachers nowadays that ain't teaching shit. You know, all they went in and did was go read a John Henry Clark. Go read a, a Dr. Ben. And they got you fooled as if they wrote that. 
And because you're not doing your own damn research. You're not doing your own damn studying. You got guys that are giving themselves these self titles now. You know, they say they're generals and commanders. The only general I know is someone's a general of an army. We in the fucking war. Where you at? I don't see you on the battleground. Because when I was in Ferguson, you know who I saw on the battleground? Was the sisters with the weeds. With the young brothers with their pads hanging down. That's who I saw on the say battleground. That. Yeah. Holding our people down. Not the RBG brothers and sisters. And I'm not knocking anybody, but I'm saying it's the standard that we have to have amongst each other if we gonna be free. We have to be clear with ourselves, and we have to have critical conversation. Because the worst thing that's happened to us in these times, we're no longer critical of each other. Mm-hmm. When I mean critical of each other, I'm talking about in an honest way, challenging us to be the best that we can be. And we have to throw this word out, out, of, out of our vocabulary. And this word is hating. Because mm. that's, that's a very deceptive and dangerous word of a people who are subjugated to self-hatred. See, Malcolm said the greatest crime the white man has ever committed against us is to hate ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I've been having a conversation, or folks have been having a conversation with me about black on black crime. And let's put that to bed. Yeah. Because black on black crime is really white on black crime. Mm. We see ourselves through white folks. Thank you. That's, that's internalized oppression. And I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm not trying to, to excuse what we do to ourselves, but putting it in the proper context. Say that. And have to understand why are any uh, four speeds of black on black crime when it's more white on white crime than black on Thank black you. crime. Thank you. Thank you. By default, because there's more white people than black Thank people. Thank you. <laughs> there's more white people that's on that's on drugs. There's more white people that's on welfare. Yes. Facts. This, this, these are the facts in the society that we live in. But we're so brainwashed and so fed, fed by what they feed us on the TV. Well, Fox 2 said it, so it gotta be true. I mean, I mean, how, how crazy is that? For you to say, because a white media said it. But this is what we rely on. And the thing that I'm saying today is not who I've always been. See, if you had told me 35 years ago, this is where I would be, I probably cussed you out. I probably would, man, when you did, why are you disrespecting me like this? Because I didn't foresee who I am today. So going to prison for a crime I didn't do, but I wasn't no angel. I gang burned. I hurt my people. And God had a plan for me. And the plan was to meet my father in prison. But prior to me getting there, he had redeemed and transformed his life. And out of that relationship, he, he, he showed me how I can redeem and transform my life. He gave me a book, the autobiography of Malcolm X. That book had awakened my mind, had, had, had gave birth to a hunger. And one of the most important books I read was called Black Women in White America. Called Black Women in White America. When I read that book, I cried myself to sleep that night. Because these sisters vividly described how babies was cut out their stomach. Vividly described the psychological warfare that had been taking place and what, what, what we don't know, no longer want to talk about slavery. And how it subjugated us to, 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 to set that behavior within, our, within that situation. And I realized that the age, if I had died at the age of 19, my legacy would have been a gangbanger. And I had disrespected those who had died for us to be where we are today. That was a powerful epiphany that had happened in my mind. And I swore from that day forward that I would do everything in my power to continue the legacy. So when you see the young little sisters doing their thing, that's the next Harriet Tubman. That's the next Asylum Shakur. That's the next Ella Baker. See, when you talk about the Civil Rights Movement, you, you talk about MLK. But it was Ella Baker who laid the blueprint. It was Ella Baker who said, strong people don't need strong leaders. See, that's what makes Malcolm so great. Because great people make great leaders. And he understood that. He understood the commitment that it took to work on behalf of a people. 
My people was beyond this time. When we see the brothers in now, it was strong and beautiful. It was his idea to organize the FOR. It was his idea to start the Muhammad speech. He, 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 he saw beyond that, that when he joined the nation of Islam and began to work on behalf of the people and the things that were necessary. We have to be visionary, but we have to be doers. He, he had a global perspective. He was a nationalist, but a revolutionary nationalist when he died, when he was taken from us. So many of us look at the struggle from a small perspective of our blocks. This is, this is a global situation. Because what's happening here in Milwaukee is happening in Detroit. What's happening in Detroit is happening in Rochester, New York. But we have to have the correct analysis. Malcolm said, you can't be talking about revolution if you're not talking about land. The central thing of, 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 of a struggle is about land. So when you look at the, 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 the situation, what happened to black people is taking our names, taking our religion, taking our culture from us and calling us color folks. And they named us Negro. And when you looked on the map, you, you didn't see a color land. You didn't see a Negro land, which allowed us to be confused. Because when you talk about Europeans, you can look to Europe. When you talk about Asia, you can look to Asia. Do you feel what I'm going with this? So, so again, identifying who we are. When he started going to Africa, he understood the connection.